The Neanderthals practice chemistry. Welcome to Answers News for Monday, June 5th, 2023. Hi, I'm Tim Chafee, and I'm joined today with, by Rob Webb and Avery Foley. Or Hello. Avery Schulenberg. There we go. <laughs> Foley works. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, today, we'll be discussing a recent discovery that suggests Neanderthals made glue. And we're going to be talking about a lot of other uh, stories as well. So let's get started with this one. Neanderthals dabbled in chemistry. Ancient glue reveals. So they found this substance among uh, some of the uh, Neanderthal remains or some of the, the um, artifacts that they had. Mm -hmm. And it looked like they made, a, they made some glue through a pretty complex process, which, uh, or process. For process, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for translating. Which is That's surprising <laughs> to the evolutionists because, mm -hmm. according to them, Neanderthals lived, you know, that they were in that stage of development from ape like ancestors to humans, and so they weren't as intelligent. And uh, how could they make things this complex? What do you think, Rob? Yeah, so throughout this whole research, they're trying to figure out how was it made, how was this glue made. So they have a couple different theories. Was it made underground? Was it made by accident? So they decided that they, they figured out through all their observations it was made underground. Um, and again, they're, they're just so surprised about it because they have the wrong starting point. They're starting mm -hmm. with that evolutionary worldview that says they're not human, they're just a bunch of dumb brutes. And again, I think. I think this is just our latest monthly installment of another piece of evidence that shows that they are human, right? They're not yeah. just dumb brutes. And had they started with the Bible, with God's word, they wouldn't have that false view of it. I mean, um, over and over again, we see evidence of Neanderthals making tools, playing music, burying their dead. In other words, acting like yeah. humans. And so it's puzzling mm -hmm. for the evolutionary worldview, but it's actually consistent for the biblical worldview. From the biblical worldview, they're fully human. They died out sometime after the flood. Now, there are some slight genetic differences within the humankind there, but... Mm -hmm. It's not, this, not the so-called human cousin like they talk about here in this paper. But obviously, the bottom line here is if, we've, if we want to properly understand human history, we got to start with the history book of the universe, which is God's word. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've been saying Neanderthals and humans, you know, that, that they're the same all along. You can find and, tons of articles on our website so saying even, that. So you even know, dozens or decades ago, we yeah. would have been saying the same thing. And yet the evolutionists for a long time, they would classify them as different species and su different subspecies. And sometimes, yeah. you know, even before that, it, they weren't even that closely related. Yeah. And every time this, a new study comes out, it's like, wow, they were really smart. And they, <laughs> yeah. they did things that humans do. Right. Like. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, it was just tough sticking through this whole article trying to. Um, through so, it. Rob was <laughs> sticking through it. <laughs> um, so, Rob, you no mentioned one got whether. That one. They just went right over their head. All you right. Mentioned, you this mentioned is going to be a great they, audience. <laughs> you mentioned how whether they made it underground or not. What's the significance of that? that yeah, so essentially they were trying to figure out, you know, whether or not um, they made this glue underground. And their conclusion here was that these Neanderthals, they distilled tar in an intentionally created underground environment that restricted oxygen flow and remained invisible during that process. Essentially, it's this complex technology, the way that they were able it's to chemistry. make this glue, basically yeah. using chemistry. So again, just add that to the list of, again, Neanderthals behaving like humans, which is, again, no surprise from the biblical worldview. Yet this makes headline news because they have a wrong starting point. Mm -hmm. They said that if this study is correct and this glue was made underground, which it appears to be based on their observational science, they said this in turn would provide valuable insight into their cognitive and cultural capabilities. But they're starting from the wrong starting point. They're trying to like discover how intelligent these people must have been and discover how cultural they might have been. Whereas when we start from the biblical worldview, we understand these people are fully human, made in the image of God, descended from Adam and Eve through Noah and his family. Uh, so we know automatically going in, these people had culture. They had cognitive ability because they're made in the image of God. And so of course they're going to use the resources God has given them living in a very harsh world after the flood to manipulate the world around them and to survive and thrive even during a difficult time in human history. So we're not surprised by this at all, yep. starting from God's word. But the evolutionists are constantly taken aback by these different finds about Neanderthals because they just don't confirm what they'd expect, starting with their evolutionary starting point. I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I wouldn't know how to make this glue or anything. <laughs> all the time they talk about all these ancients did this. Yeah. Birch yeah, bark, I, bark, I, I don't know. I can tell you. Neanderthals were smarter than us, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and it's, it is kind of funny with Neanderthals because they do have a larger cranial capacity, larger brain size, which that does not determine intelligence. But you'll hear the scientists talk about it that way. Like a lot of times, like, oh, they got a larger brain, so they're more intelligent. It's like, well, 
I think we all know that that doesn't, that, that, yeah. that's not how it works. Because Tim has a giant brain. I've got a bigger head. I mean, and on, and, well, let's see, this is the women, like on average, men have a larger head than women. Does that mean that? Right. No, because men and women are equal in terms of intelligence mm -hmm. on average. So it's not, it's, yeah. it's just kind of silly that they get away with promoting that yeah, all the time. And they keep doing that, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to our next one because, speaking of humans, we are unique. I don't know if you knew that, but not exceptional. Uh, we're not Who's an flat? exceptional species of mammal. <laughs> so in this study, this is a, a pretty strange one. What they wanted to do is compare, a whole, what, 80,000 different um, representatives or... or yeah, 80,000 different individuals, individuals from 90 so what, human yeah. populations. Yeah, so what they're doing is studying how do, um, how do humans raise their young and how do they get together as families compared to how other mammals would do that. And um, guess what, we're, we're different. I bet you all could have figured that out without yeah. a scientific study, Avery, to be honest. Are you shocked? <laughs> I'm yeah. shocked. Humans are different than mammal, other mammals. Like, the, what? We're, we don't raise yeah. our young the that, same way as we need panthers? breaking this news is amazing. up there. This is like a news flash, right? <laughs> yeah, this was obviously Avery's favorite article of all time. She loved this article, uh, Well, right? I literally wrote at the top that this <laughs> article, like I, I read through the sum, this popular summary, and then I went back and read parts of the actual study, and it literally reads like you're reading some kind of like bogus article trying to be published as a real scientific study. Like it's just... Was it written by AI? nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was written by AI. I don't know. Yeah. It was just nonsense. It was all about reproductive skew in... In, in humans versus non-human mammals, and it basically just kept coming back to, well, humans raise young, and these mammals raise young, but humans do it different. But there are some similarities. But, like, but there are some. Yeah. Well, of course, there's going to be some similarity because we both have to like feed our young and like protect them from danger. Like it was just, it was a really. The technical term yeah. is mumbo jumbo, right? Yeah. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. Just I, mumbo jumbo. I think, I think this is when we say this is your tax dollars at work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just like the last yeah. article, this is really just a battle of two competing worldviews. Mm -hmm. You got the evolutionary worldview that says humans are just animals, nothing special, right? Um, but the biblical worldview says every single person is made in, in the image of God. That man is God. Uh, Every human being is God's ground, crowning glory of his creation. So, um, again, mm -hmm. this is actually just an attack on the marriage and the family unit here. And they, they go through it. They're, they're very puzzled. They're very surprised at the fact that um, human families thrive when they have a mother and a father raising children. They, they actually acknowledge that in the yeah. article. That, that, that's yeah, the they're fact. very surprised at the fact that you need a mother, you need a father to be able to raise a family, to be able to raise children properly. But, again, if we start with God's word, we start with the biblical worldview, of course. God made male and female yeah. is different, but to complement each other, in raising children. So you actually see that uh, basically borrowing from the biblical worldview as they're going through this. And it's like, well, duh, of course you would need a mm -hmm. mother and the father to raise, it, raise a yeah. child. Yeah, and, and this is another example of how um, the evolutionary worldview tries to explain everything. Like some Christians will try and adopt parts of the evolutionary worldview and be like, well, science tells us. So we have to believe that, you know, Adam evolved from some kind of ape-like ancestor. But if you're going to go with, quote unquote, what the science says, which is really science just people's interpretation of the evidence, then where do you draw the line and stop being like, okay, well, we're going to reinterpret the Bible. So now we have to reinterpret family and understand it as just very similar to what mammals do, just a little bit different. And we're not exceptional at all. We're really just very much similar to the mammals. Like, where do you draw the line and be like, no, this is what the word of God says and I'm going to stand on God's word. Well, if you're compromising the evolutionary worldview, that's really hard to do because if your authority is the scientist, not mm -hmm. the word of God, then you have to go along with all of these ridiculous studies exactly. um, in order to be consistent. But when we go back to what the word of God says, we can say, no, we're going to interpret the evidence through the lens of what God's word says, not through the lens of sinful, fallible scientists who don't know everything, who weren't there and yeah. who frequently make mistakes. Yeah, marriage is meaningless in the animal kingdom. Yeah. I mean, just go to the zoo today. Try, try to look at maybe some of the monkeys trying to raise their young. Now look at, um, you know, go to one of our houses and how we raise our children. There's, it's, it's, it's not Humans even, are exceptional, despite what this article says. Yeah, it's, it's not even It close. might seem like a zoo in your house once in a while, but <laughs> I was gonna you've say, got four little ones. I was going to say, I, I got three little ones. She's got four little ones. So <laughs> it, it does seem like a zoo. But again, it just, just, just look at it. I mean, it just takes right, common yeah. sense. Yeah. One of the things this article does, too, it seems to be giving a nod to something we're going to talk about in a little bit where these um, polyamorous relationships where you have, in this case, they're talking about where there's one man with multiple women. They're saying that women, that the, that it, you can raise more children in those homes and you can, it's better off economically. And it's like, well, yeah, if you have like five adults all being able to work yeah, or four yeah. of them working and uh, yeah, had one rookie, you had, you had right. as many bills. So of course that part makes sense, but they're, it seems like they're trying to set you up for 
what's right, yeah. coming down the road real yeah, quickly. Yeah, like, oh, this is actually a good relationship. No, it, it comes with a host of other problems and what's that when you go away from called? God's that, word. That poly, uh, well, we were debating on how it. to pronounce that. Um, po- Polygynous, polygynous or, or relationship. Polygynous. Yeah, we or, still don't know how to say it. <laughs> Not no, polygamous. this is a different one. Because so, no, this is different. So we, we Google searched it, and then Google had a weird translation for it. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> because that's the fount of all knowledge, right? The yeah, Google search. Exactly. You go to Google for everything. We're going to talk about actually coming up. And all right. Well, let's move on here. Let's uh, talk about the 153,000-year-old footprints from South Africa that are the oldest Homo sapien tracks on record, allegedly. So uh, yeah. this one they found from the very southern tip of uh, South Africa, and they found these footprints that um, they seem to be eroding kind of quickly. So they did mm-hmm. these tests on them, and th- they determined they're 153,000 years old, which would be the oldest in their classifications of hu- Homo sapiens. They'll have mm-hmm. other ones that would be from supposed relatives that are older, but mm-hmm. from our and, specific species. And the reason for that isn't a difference in the footprints. Like they talk up in here about the 3.66 supposedly million year old footprints from Laetolia in Tanzania. Those footprints look identical to mm-hmm. a human Just footprint. Like ones. The and only reason that they say that they're not human is because humans aren't supposed to have evolved yet. Right. Not and because of anything about the footprints themselves. And you can see those in our starting points exhibit mm-hmm. here in here the, the museum. museum. So if you haven't looked at those yet, you can go back yeah, and take sure a look at it. You see a comparison out. between human prints and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what ape, uh, what uh, Australopithecines, what their prints would be like, mm-hmm. and compare that to the Laetoli. Mm-hmm. So when they, they talk here about these footprints, these 153,000 year old footprints being the oldest footprints, well, these other ones from the Laetoli layers, the 3.6 6 million year old, they're they're roughly so the same age. They're, they're both post-flood, mm-hmm. um, so probably just separated by a few decades, maybe a few centuries, maybe. Um, that's that's about it. And like so. Avery was saying, again, it, it comes down to the interpretation of it. Mm-hmm. They're interpreting it as human only if the date fits within their imaginary timeline. That's why you always we always say this here, often here. You got to separate the facts from the fiction, the observations mm-hmm. from the storytelling. Um, we all have the same evidence. We have the same footprints. But again, it comes down to the observation. How do we actually interpret that evidence in front of us? You know. And so over and over again, they assert all these time frames, 153,000, just assert it as a fact, right? As with every single one mm-hmm. of these articles, you see, they just assert it as a fact without actually explaining any of the assumptions that go into it. But I think overall, they just sidestep the obvious explanation here. Sidestep. But, All right. Um, you know. so they so, they yeah, talk about on, how... No, I mean, oh. it's just, you just start with the biblical worldview. We'd expect to find human footprints and rock layers. I mean, that's as evidence of the global flood. That's what it is. Yeah, they talk here about um, going back to the dating method. They get those dates based on um, what's called OSL dating, a specific uh, form of, of dating method, yeah. looking at um, quartz and feldspar in the in the tracks themselves. Um, but that that dating method, like all the other dating methods, has a lot of assumptions. And if any of those assumptions are wrong, the results are going to be incorrect. And there was another study that was done on footprints um, back in the early 2000s in Mexico. And based on this OSL dating, they were believed to be 40,000 years old. Well, that date didn't really, a lot of the evolutionists weren't happy with that date. They really didn't like it because it put humans in the Americas way earlier than they're supposed to be. So people had issues. So they redated the, the, the rock around the footprints using a different form of radiometric dating. And it came up with an age of 1.3 million years. Um, obviously, both of those dates cannot be correct. We would say neither of those dates are correct mm-hmm. because that goes against what we know from the timeline given in the word of God. But it just shows you there's a lot of assumptions going into this and a lot of assumptions in dating. If they get different dates, they'll just throw out the ones that don't match the evolutionary timeline and go with the one that they think is closest to what they were expecting. Yeah, whatever so fits their story. You've got to be very careful when you see these dates being thrown around. There's a lot of assumptions going into that. It's not this hard and fast science that so many people think So even in this article, they have the, the image that you can see there. And it says a 3D photogrammetry track image from a site near where this footprint was, so very near. And this one is only in, it's younger, it's only in the 76 to 90,000 year range. Well, first of all, that's a pretty big spread (laughs) time. Very big. And so we're led to believe that this one right next, or very near the other one, for what, 75,000 year difference just between them? And those ones just sat there with no problem. And yet when we yeah. see them today, they're eroding pretty quickly. Yeah, and we the gotta, researchers are like struggling yeah, to research right. them quickly before they vanish, yeah. but they lasted for 153,000 years. Just the dumb luck, you know, of evolution. Just yeah, some, don't let the evidence get in the way, guys. That's, that's what I always say. All right, well, let's move on to our next article here. And this one, uh, quote, am I gay? End quote, related Google searches soar 1300% in 19 years. And so they, the Cultural Currents Institute released an analysis. They looked up a bunch of different phrases like this one, am I gay or how to come out or am I a lesbian, am I trans, those similar 
terms and saw that they, were, they had increased by 1,300% in just the last 19 years. Why would that be? Um, Avery, what do you think? Is, there, <laughs> is it just, is that what we would expect if this was, were a natural thing? And yeah, no, statistically speaking, no. I mean, it's pretty obvious to anyone who's paying attention to what's going on in the culture. Mm -hmm. This is being shoved on children at increasingly younger and younger and younger and younger ages. They're being told that any slight um, abnormality you may have, if you feel slightly uncomfortable with your body, if you feel, you know, any, any of these different weird feelings, oh, it must mean that you are non-binary or you're trans or you're pansexual or you're whatever. Or Avery, if you All like playing with trucks when you were little or if you right, like the exactly. color blue or Rob, if you're, like if you're more of a tomboy than a girly girl, well, maybe that means you're trans or you're gender non-conforming or you're gender queer or you're whatever. And so, of course, you're going to have all these confused kids who hit 13, 14, 15, and all of a sudden they're like, well, maybe that's maybe that's why I feel so uncomfortable. Maybe that's this, maybe that. And so they start searching these things. And of course, unfortunately, Google is going to give them the very wrong answer to their question. Um, so it's... It's no shock to those who are paying attention that this is soaring, and it's not because this is just a natural thing. This is because the the children of today's world are just being steeped in this ideology, and they're being brainwashed by their schools, by social media, by the content they're consuming on TikTok and YouTube and other social media platforms. They're being groomed to go in this direction, and statistics like this really do, do show that it, it's unfortunately working, and it's it's leading to a generation of very confused young people. Yeah, if you just take a step back and look big picture here, I mean, this indoctrination is just everywhere. Yeah. Or as Vladi Bakum says, er, er, everywhere, right? Which is more than everywhere, it's <laughs> everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's just, I mean, everywhere you look, it's, it's, it's everywhere, left, right, and center. Um, and I want you guys to realize that this is actually just a symptom of the root cause, and the root mm -hmm. cause is the rejection, the abandonment of God's word, really the compromise of God's word. That's what, that's what we've been seeing over the last generation. We've been seeing the compromise of God's word over and over again, not just from society elevating their own uh, opinion above God's word, but we're also seeing a compromise in the church today. So many pastors yeah. and Christian leaders today, especially in the pulpit, they're compromising God's word, not standing boldly on God's authority. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, God's word is God, the whole Bible is, is God breathed. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's uh, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that every single person of God can be equipped for every good work. And so we need to be standing boldly on God's word to take back this culture. That's what really what it comes down to. Go back to the authority of God's word, start speaking the truth and love into this culture. And by the way, um, if, if you are one of those people who are Google searching, am I gay? You know, you're looking in the wrong place. Google's not going to be able to give you that answer. The only answer you can go to is God's word. You got to start with the Bible. The Bible says that he made you either male or female on purpose for a purpose. God doesn't make mistakes and he can make you a new creation when you bend the knee and repent, believe in Jesus Christ as your only hope and savior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the study talked about how um, some of the states that were where these searches were the most frequent. Uh, Utah was surprising to them because it's generally known as a pretty conservative state. Kentucky, number two, uh, for the am I trans search. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, it's when you get some of the more liberal states, liberal leaning states, that they're not as frequent. Well, that's not really surprising because in those states you have it being pushed in the schools all the time. The kids don't actually have to run a search for those things because their teachers are talking about it on a regular basis. And, yeah. um, but in some of the states where that's not being pushed as hard, uh, then, then they're still hearing that from the different you know, mm -hmm. social media influencers or anything else, and so they are asking those questions. And by the way, real quick, we, we actually have a book called here, Divided Nation. I would say this is probably one of the textbooks of our ministry other than the Bible, of course, uh, written by our CEO and founder, Ken Ham. Um, really, it's just a really good book and talks about all of these cultural, political, uh, religious lines that we're seeing in the culture. Uh, Ken does a good job of just saying that there's only two religions, there's just two worldviews. It's either God's word or not God's word. Um, and so mm -hmm. we're, we're actually seeing um, not the replacement of religion, but we're seeing the, the Christianity is being kicked out of the school systems, prayers being thrown out, um, you know, the Ten Commandments are being thrown out, and they're being replaced with a different religion of secular humanism. That's what we're seeing here today in our culture. So I highly encourage you guys, if you guys are concerned with taking back this culture, really, um, if, if you guys are concerned with the lives and souls of the next generation, I would highly encourage you to check out this book um, to get yourself equipped. And one of the things that you can pick up if you read this article, you'll see that the slant or the bias is coming through. So the last paragraph talks about how mm. um, many conservative led states are pursuing legislation targeting LGBTQ members, especially the youth trans community, community. A record of 490 bills targeting LGBTQ rights have been introduced. What do they, what do they classify as targeting LGBTQ rights? Well, if it means you're not um, indoctrinating 
kindergartners yeah. with this kind of stuff, or does mm -hmm. it mean you're not going to have children drag to make queen life reading the changing yeah, decisions so at that's, eight? That's targeting their rights. Yeah. Uh, but that's yeah. how it's, it's spun to yeah. make it seem These as if they're being These bills are protecting children, and they're of course planting right. them in a. All right. Well, moving direction. on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mentioned this article earlier that we'd be addressing this. So, uh, in uh, New York, a, a New York Times polyamory puff piece proves that Christians are right again. See, for a long time, and we've been saying it up here for several years, yeah. that hey, this is not the end game. When they started talking about gay marriage. That wasn't the end game for them. They're not going to be content with that because then you're going to see right. this next thing and then this next thing and then the next thing. And then, oh, that's a slippery slope argument. You can't use it. There is such a thing called slippery slope where it can be an invalid argument, but it can also be a real argument because mm -hmm. we've seen it happen time and time and time mm -hmm. again. And in this case, we yep. knew that was what yep. was coming. Mm -hmm. And um, in this article, the way the New York Times talks about it, it's pretty obvious that we were right. They're, they're really pushing for the next thing, to, uh, among other things, one of the next things I should say, to be the legalization of polyamory, where people can have these different relationship structures. No longer is it two and two, like we've already seen one man and one woman be erased, now it can be two men or two women. Well, they want to ultimately get rid of that as well, and it can be any relationship structure that you want. It's all about what the individual wants and, and nothing else. And, and that makes sense in their worldview because if you don't have a worldview based on the authority and mm -hmm. the absolutes of the word of God, all you have is human opinion. And human opinions change all the time and all you have is what sinful hearts want. And of course, that's just going to be more sin and more depravity because that's what our hearts are. And so this New York Times puff piece they're talking about here going on about polyamory and how these, these individuals that are involved in these relationships, they just need to be more accepted. There, there's still so much negativity around the idea of polyamory and we need to be reducing that negativity so these people can live their authentic, true lives and be their true selves. Um, throughout this article, they, and then like some of the examples they give of, of the one relationship they talk about is this man who currently has a nesting partner, a long-term partner, two long-distance partners, and I'm not going to use the word um, that they use in this article, but a physically-based relationship, you can figure out what that means, with another person. So this, like, just the absurdity of this man's relationships with all these different people. He's got this person lives with him, and these people are long-distance, but he's in a relationship with them. And it's just, it, it's so confusing, and it's so chaotic, and it's so different from God's design where one man and one woman come together in the lifelong covenant union of marriage, and they mm -hmm. raise their children to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Like, such a difference that we get when we depart from the authority of the Word of God. And this is, this is what's being pushed in the culture, and more and more of this is coming as... The same thing happened with the with the LGBTQ stuff with legalizing gay marriage. They started putting stories out there. Oh, look at these people. They love each other. They're not they're not allowed to get married. You should feel sad. You should feel really bad about this. And then they slowly start to get people reeled in with all these emotional stories. But we don't we should not be making decisions based on our emotions. We make our decisions based on the authority of the word of God, not what our hearts may tell us. We go back to God's word and we say, no, what does God's word say? God's word says mm -hmm. that God has defined love for us. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, and it's not what we see in this article. Um, love is self-sacrificial. Love lives according to the word of God. And so we go back to God's word. So I like the opening line in this. It says, for fear-mongering hicks, yeah. conservative Christians are remark yeah, <laughs> remarkably <you> prescient. So, <laughs> right. so how do we, how can we predict that? I right. Mean, that's amazing. All right, and, Rob, what do you and, think? and like Avery was saying, I mean, basically the, the author even points it out, you know, it's nothing more than feeling shaped by what public opinion is willing to accept. Yeah. And it's just more evidence that we're living in the Romans one culture where God has given us over to this debased mind to do what ought not to be done. We're also seeing it just an attack on the family unit, marriage. It's, mm -hmm. it's the same attack the enemy has been doing ever since the very beginning, Genesis chapter three. Yeah. The enemy is always looking for a way to distort God's designs and he's doing it with marriage here. And by the way, we haven't uh, actually reinterpret the marriage, we've only blasphemed the God who created it, who establishes it. And that's what we're seeing here today. And it's actually no surprise. I mean, you, if you reject God, then that means you elevate man's opinion as the supreme authority. And when mm -hmm. you do that, then that means anything goes. You can redefine marriage. You can be say marriage is whatever you want. There's no ultimate standard to go back to. That's why it's so important as Christians, we go back to God's word as our ultimate standard, really to have that Christian worldview really founded on the solid rock of God's word, not the shifting sands of man's opinions. So I think one thing you need to be aware of, this is something that has been planned for a very long time in mm -hmm. this culture. Going yeah. back to the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, you can read some of the early postmodern writers telling people to stand for 
anything and everything that is contrary to the Judeo-Christian values because their goal was to tear down this society. It isn't, mm -hmm. they, this article talks about how, this is why with regard, to the, with regard to the sexual revolution, the slippery slope has been more prophetic than fallacious. Well, that's true, but it isn't really about sexual revolution. It is about destroying mm -hmm. and undermining the foundations of this society, which begin with the family and then the church and the, and that's been their end game all along. So right. this polyamory thing is not gonna be the end. It's gonna no. continue to go to you break down even what it means to be a male and female. It, that's it's where they're going new. with it. Yeah, this, is, right. this, is, this has been going mm -hmm. on and on. And even if you go back to that last generation, they essentially had a three-prong attack. They wanted to number one, desensitize the culture, which they've been doing with small bits of information in TV and movies and shows. Uh, number two, in terms of jamming the culture, trying to make it so like, if you talk about any, if you talk against homosexuality, then you're automatically made like a bigot or uh, you're associated with the KKK. And then that number three, conversion. And that's what we're seeing here today. We're seeing the celebration and the encouragement of this wickedness. And, and they've been, like Tim was saying, they've been playing the long game in this. So really this shouldn't yeah. surprise us. All right, well, let's go to the other side of the world. And that is down under. The dingo proof yeah. fence could be driving astonishingly fast kangaroo evolution. <laughs> now, um, if you're not familiar with the dingo fence, this is like a 3,500 mile fence that is in Australia that they put in to keep out most of the dingoes because they've got very rich farmland in the southeastern part of the nation. And uh, so it's that black, thick black line there in the map. And uh, so that's been uh, there for a while. And you can see where the dingoes live. The darker gold color there is where there's a lot of them. And and what's happening in this situation is the kangaroos that live um, inside or in the, on the safe side of the dingo fence, the southeastern part, uh, those ones, the babies are developing or the joeys are developing slower. Mm -hmm. And the ones that live beyond the fence, I think in the article it calls it inside the fences are the ones that are with the dingoes. So that's why I was confused by a little bit. But the ones that are where all the dingoes are, they, the red kangaroos, their joeys are growing much more rapidly. And so they're saying, well, is this evolution that's being driven by this man-made fence? What do you think? It must be, right? Of, of course. Any small change within a population has yeah. to be attributed to evolution. That's because that's their explanation for everything. everything. Even though, yep. guess what? You'll all be shocked. The kangaroos Becomes? stayed kangaroos. Yes. No way. They just, they just developed kangaroos a little bit slower. Kangaroos are still kangaroos so at the end of the day. The, yep. The kangaroos that live with the dingoes, if you're a, basically your only defense against a dingo is to be a big kangaroo. Because if you're a big kangaroo, you've got big, strong feet. You can kick the dingo. You can defend yourself. If you're a little tiny, cute little joey, mm -hmm. you're not going to survive against the dingo. So if you grow faster, you have a better chance of surviving to reproduce if you live with dingoes. Um, whereas with the, the kangaroos that don't really have to deal with the dingoes, well, they don't need to grow as fast because they don't have that selection pressure. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, they're attributing that to evolution because everything must be interpreted through the lens of an evolutionary worldview, yeah. um, even when it doesn't make sense. Because in this article, they're like, this is happening so fast. We do not expect to see evolution happening so quickly right before our eyes. They're not observing evolution at all. Um, likely what they're observing here is natural selection. Hey, what's a, what's a favorite, uh, what's Kangaroo's favorite season, Avery? Oh no. I think we should probably keep going before Rob Spring. Hanks. Spring is his favorite season. Oh boy. Let's hop to it. Um, <laughs> so we <Sorry>. have, <sighs> yeah, we've done articles like this before, not with the kangaroo, but with other, uh, what we call speciation. So you have this variation within a kind. So God has created the kind of animals and dogs will always be mm -hmm. dogs, cats will always be cats. Mm -hmm. Kangaroos are always gonna be kangaroos. Yep. And yeah, you're gonna get variation. And maybe it yeah. could get to the point where over time, these ones can no longer interbreed and they might even start to classify them as different subspecies or something. Even though we know they both came from the red kangaroo, um, that doesn't mean that evolution has happened. They're lose if that were the case, it would be a loss of genetic information, not a gain of information, which is what exactly. is required for yep. evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the genetic information is already present there, so you don't see an yeah. increase in information. And you see that throughout this whole article. They're equivocating on that word evolution. What they really mean is natural selection. That's what we're seeing here with this article. Mm -hmm. So the kangaroos, despite kangaroos the headline, kangaroos. are not evolving. Moving They're just on. staying kangaroos. I did get to see lots of them when I was there a few months ago. I, I knew you were going to bring up your trip to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> well, going from that good news that I was there to some <laughs> more good news, Planned Parenthood laying off 20% of workforce. Pro-life leader offers them life-affirming options. Now, I was Say really woot woot. confused by this because, it, you know, about a, almost a year ago, the Roe v. Wade was struck down by the Supreme Court. But we had been told for so long 
that Planned Parenthood, yeah. the, uh, abortion is just a tiny little bit of what they do. Yeah. So why would 20% of the workforce need to be laid off or, or cut if... Right. They're, they're saying in here that, that reproductive freedom is in jeopardy and so they're restructuring. But yeah. if... if, if but not if because abortion of economic is things, only right? it's part of what they do, yeah. then yeah. maybe because they've been lying mm. <laughs> about what most of what they do is is actually murdering unborn children, despite what they like to tell everybody to make themselves um, look like they're the good yeah, guys. Yeah, it was, it was kind of confusing because in here they say the changes do not reflect financial struggle, struggles, but they also say it was because of difficult economic conditions. So I don't really know which way to take that. <laughs> but um, it's also just a reminder here, the end of Roe v. Wade did not end abortion in right. this country. It's something mm -hmm. we say often. They actually just uh, created 50 different state level battles here. So we got to keep going. Uh, the war is far from over. We got to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just quote, quote the two, uh, a few different verses here from Proverbs and I'll get off my soapbox here. Uh, Proverbs 24, 10 through 11 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. And Proverbs 31, 8, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves for the rights of all who are destitute. Really, those are our marching orders, Christians. That's what we got to be doing. Mm -hmm, and so. uh, I'll just say, Rob is very genuine and very passionate about this topic. And I mean, we all are, but um, um, Rob is often bit. on the front lines when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so thank you for always standing up for the unborn. Um, if you guys have not checked out Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, the exhibit here at the Creation Museum, make sure you do that. The writing in beautiful. there is amazing. Um, and in the article, they quote Abby Johnson. Uh, we've actually got a movie that details her life. She's somebody who worked uh, for uh, the mm -hmm. this abortion she industry. And, yeah, she was a director, and then she left and now has mm -hmm. been um, the name strongly pro-life and speaking against that. Um, very uh, touching film. If you haven't seen that, it's, it can be hard. Yeah, there's a couple scenes that are very difficult to watch, but I highly encourage you guys. It really just exposes what's going on in these abortion mills. And she actually, at the end, offers an invitation to the people who work at Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. that are losing their jobs to come and uh, work at, here's how she says it, uh, there are so many better jobs that don't require such soul-sucking, savage work. I mean, it's, it's pretty blunt. Say but, it like it is. But she's somebody who right knows there. she was there. Yeah. I like um, the way yeah. she put it. One resource we didn't mention before is our book, Searching for Adam. We were talking about Neanderthals earlier. We were talking about ancient man. And if you want to know who Adam really was, well, we go back to Genesis, but we've got um, a book here that was uh, headed up by Terry Mortensen, uh, one of our researchers, and he... Uh, contacted several other experts to write on various issues related to Adam, and that will counter a lot of the false teaching that we're seeing, not just mm -hmm. in our world, not just in the secular groups, but by even people like like William Lane Craig, who wrote a book, uh, The Quest for Adam, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it just, um, it com yeah, it just completely buys into the evolutionary story. This is going to start from God's word and show you the truth of what Scripture teaches. All right, we've got a couple of uh, slides here to talk about. We've got our Answers for Educators conference coming up on July 24th. So if you are uh, specifically for Christian school teachers or administrators, this is for you. Uh, make sure you mark down that date, July 24th, and you can go to getanswers.org slash educators for more details. And anybody want to go to the Galapagos Islands with a few of our researchers? So that's going to be Dr. Amazing. George Burdum, nice. is that right? Uh, and Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Rivera, Rivera and okay. her daughter, okay. um, and Jessica Jaworski. Okay. And I believe Dr. Like Purdom had been there before. So. Yes, yeah. All right. Yeah, and that's going to be a pretty cool trip, really a big adventure trip, but learning mm -hmm. about the Galapagos Islands through the lens of God's word rather than through the typical evolutionary lens that and you usually hear about it through. next year. May next year. 28th through June yep. 6th, I believe. Oh, so next year, got the 2024. Exact dates marked down. <laughs> all right, so mark your calendars or go to that website. You got there, that website. Find out more details. All right, well, that is all the time that we have for today. We want to thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. God bless. God, God bless. bless.